Uh, so what is the problem some members are having with the Book of Abraham? Probably the major problem that members have had with the Book of Abraham is that their trust or confidence in the scriptural text has been undermined. And there are a variety of different arguments that have been put forward that are designed to undermine their faith. Um, and some of these have to deal with the Book of Abraham. And so most of the, the issues that they have have to do with um, how their faith or their confidence in, in the scriptural text has been uh, subverted. Uh, what can be frustrating about trying to find answers to these questions or problems? Well, I think there are a couple of different reasons why people get frustrated in finding answers. Is And the first one is identified in, the, um, in Section 123 in the Doctrine and Covenants. They don't know where to find it. And so we have needed for some time a centralized repository of the major arguments about the Book of Abraham and the things that support its historical authenticity and um, show that it is what it claims to be. And Pearl Great Price Central has provided a nice repository for those uh, articles and arguments and it tries to provide them in a way that's accessible to a general public. You don't need, um, so I had 10 years of graduate training in Egyptology and you shouldn't need that to necessarily be able to follow the arguments and with Pearl Great Price Central you don't have to. What's a specific example from Pearl of Great Price that showed to you that it was a good resource to help people's questions about the Book of Abraham? There are over 40 different articles up there. And so, and I was on the committee that reviewed all of those articles. And so picking out one is something of a problem. Yeah. Uh, and having been involved in research on the Book of Abraham for many years, um, I have seen many different iterations of some of these arguments uh, and all stages from uh, first idea to initial publication in a scholarly venue, some cases been peer reviewed and vetted the, the material, some cases did the, the research from the ground up. And so in this current iteration in Pearl Great Price Central, it's hard to pick just one because either you have several favorites or um, there's too much good work by my colleagues that picking out one is just sorts of, um, you, know, you, you slight some work by, some good work by other colleagues by picking one. And the real impressive thing is that there are so many. To me, that's probably more important than saying, oh, this, this one is really good because, yeah, there's this one that's really good and that one that's really good, but that you have so many of them. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily cover all of the arguments that are out there for uh, the historical authenticity of the Book of Abraham. Uh, it's not comprehensive that way, but it's still uh, overwhelming. How can Pearl of Great Price Central help better people's lives in understanding the Book of Abraham? 
Pearl of Great Price Central, like Book of Mormon Central, helps you understand the scriptural text. As you understand the scriptural text and apply it to you in your life, then your life gets better. And it can assist that in helping you understand the, the scriptural text and see its applicability. And so, for example, um, for some people, you know, we, we look at Abraham and he's the father of the, the faithful. And we realize his importance and his faithfulness. What we often don't realize, and which might help some people who are in a similar background, is he comes from a somewhat dysfunctional family. His father tried to kill him. Uh, his father was not faithful. And for somebody coming out of that background, being able to see that this is a real person who, who lived a real life and overcame some of the challenges that uh, people are still facing, some people, uh, that it can provide both a model for an individual and hope for that individual. Uh, but you have to be able to understand the text and then apply it to your own situation to see how it is that um, you progress on that path to faith. Um, and another example is that Abraham doesn't start out as a uh, as faithful as he ends up. He starts out saying, well, God asked me to do a hard thing, to leave my family. And he actually puts his reasoning in there. He says, well, God delivered me in the past, and therefore I would do well to hearken to his voice. This isn't the sort of obedience that he has later with the when he's asked to sacrifice Isaac, but he starts off it saying, well, this worked out well for me in the past, and so I will, I, it would be important for me and good for me to follow the inspiration that I received. So he, his faith builds over time. And then they, again, that's a, a facet of understanding the text. And then you apply that to your life and you can say, all right, I'm not Abraham at the end of his life, but maybe I can be Abraham in Abraham chapter two. Why is something like Pearl of Great Price Central necessary? Well, Pearl of Great Price Central is necessary because there needs to be a place that you can go to get an information on, on the Book of Abraham and other things in the Pearl of Great Price, uh, just as there is in Book of Mormon Central where you need to have a place where you can get access to good material on the Book of Mormon. If before Pearl of Great Price Central came into existence, uh, information on, on on research on the Book of Abraham was scattered literally all over the place. Um, there were obscure publications out of Budapest. There were um, including one that I don't even have a copy of. Um, and there were, you know, conferences in Warsaw and, um, and just material scattered all over the place. And there wasn't a central repository where you could go and get access to the information that you might like to have if you wanted to know more about the Book of Abraham. And so something like this is very helpful. Is it maybe fair to say that not only was it scattered everywhere, but a lot of this stuff is in various different languages and things like that? Some of the material is in diff different languages, and it can be a, a problem. I think most of the research on Book of Abraham has been in, in English, and that's been... Um, that's been 
more accessible to most members of the church. But it draws on materials of other scholars that are in things like German, French, ancient Egyptian, ancient Greek, Turkish, uh, Hungarian, uh, which, Dutch, uh, which is really daunting for the average person to confront. And so that it's, it's nice to have something available in a, one of the major languages. Why has so much research gone into the Book of Abraham? Um, if you compare the Book of Abraham to the Book of Mormon or to the Bible, comparatively little research has gone into the Book of Abraham. But that doesn't mean that there hasn't been a whole lot done. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why it's there has been a lot of research. One of the reasons I do research on it is that there are so many basic things that haven't been explored or basic questions answered. And there are still a number of those that are out there that these are basic questions that haven't been answered. But there are fewer of those now than there were 30 years ago. And a num uh, some great strides have been made in establishing the historical authenticity of the Book of Abraham. So to give an example, uh, 40 years ago when I, uh, yeah, well, 40 years ago, that was before I started doing this seriously, but at that time, the standard thing was that Abraham is never mentioned in Egypt. And, uh, and so one of the first things I did was publish somebody else's, uh, had, somebody else had actually found an example of it. And it turned out there were a lot of examples of Abraham being mentioned in Egypt. Um, sometimes you just have to look for them in order to find them. Uh, it helps and the, the, with the training that uh, some of us have, we know better where to go looking. Uh, but we might not know what we're looking for. And sometimes you can work with a problem for years and just real, suddenly realize, I've been looking at this wrong. And this is what I need to look for. And then when you look for it, there it is. You found it. And you find lots of examples of it. Uh, so there are, uh, there's a lot of research that has been done. And we are in a better position now to confirm the historical authenticity of the Book of Abraham, or at least establish its historical plausibility, than we ever have been. Obviously, a lot more research has been done on the Bible, and there's a lot more people working on research in the Bible. I mean, Latter-day Saints are pretty much the only people who care about what's going on with the Book of Abraham, uh, and maybe a, a that's, few That's others. largely true, yes. <laughs> For the most part, only Latter-day Saints care about the Book of Abraham, just like only Latter-day Saints care about the Book of Mormon. Right. Um, there, there is essentially no serious non-Latter-day Saint scholarship on the Book of Mormon or just a minuscule percent at, right. at best that you could describe as serious. And, and that's the same way with the Book of Abraham. The Bible, of course, has many different denominations who have a vested interest in exploring the text and a lot more scholars and scholarship that's done on the biblical text than there is on, on the Book of Mormon. Uh, yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, so one thing though that you hear sometimes is people will say something like, 
uh, well, well, they'll ask, why do we need all this research on the book of Abraham if it's true? Because uh, for some reason they think scholarship and, and complicated scholarly arguments somehow are proof that it's not true or, or something along those lines. How, what, how would you respond to someone? Well, uh, so in the book of Abraham, to a great extent, doesn't need um, doesn't need a lot of research, and you can certainly read it as a devotional text without any uh, without a reference to any scholarly material. And there's nothing wrong with reading it that way. Um, in C.S. Lewis screw tape letters. He has his double screw tape say uh, that um, no one reads old texts except the learned, and we have now so dealt with the learned that they are of all people the least likely to gain wisdom by doing so. So somebody who is reading the book of Abraham as a sacred text, because the reading is a sacred text, they will get things out of it that no scholar would. And to the extent that they're inspired and receive inspiration through their reading on that, that's actually even better than, than doing the scholarship. So the question you almost have to ask is, what's the point of doing scholarship on the Book of Abraham then? Uh, you know, if you look at the way the Book of Abraham is used in the church, most of the Book of Abraham, or most citations of the Book of Abraham, come from uh, only about half a dozen verses at the end of chapter three. And these are extremely important in the church, and they're referred to all the time. And there are probably some people who wouldn't be able to tell you a single thing that occurs in the book of Abraham outside of those six verses, and that's okay. So why are we doing the, the scholarship? Well, there are two reasons to do it. One is that there are people who have questions about the historical authenticity of the Book of Abraham. And those people, to be able to show them that the Book of Abraham is historically plausible for Abraham's day is important for them to, and it reassures them, that what they're putting their faith in is something that is worth putting faith in. And so that's one reason to do it. But the other reason to do it, um, and well, uh, different people need different things. But one of the things, the other reasons to do it is that s sometimes the research can help you understand the text better and see more applicable things for your own life. It helps you apply the text in a, um, you can see connections that you hadn't seen before about why this text applies to my life. Um, this is the way of reading it that C.S. Lewis was pointing out in his screw tape letter is, is that if you, if you're reading it as a literary text or you're reading it as um, some sort of scholarly construct, it's very hard to get out of the text something that God would want you to, to get out of the text. It's hard to find something to make it applicable. And so some of the research is to say, well, there is this in the, in the text that makes it more applicable to one's life. So um, let me give you an example of that. So if you have a, if you're reading it as a scholarly construct or as a literary text, you can say, oh yeah, there's this light motif and 
so forth. And there is a light motif that runs through the Book of Abraham on obedience. And it starts in the first chapter and is developed all the way through the, the Book of Abraham about, and even shows up when they're discussing the purpose of mortal life is to prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. So their it, obedience is implicit in defining what the purpose of life is. And it's not just a literary motif. I mean, the fact that it runs through there, that's interesting, but you, then if you can take that and say, well, what does this tell me about the importance of obedience? How can I see how Abraham obeyed, even when it was hard or confusing or didn't make that much sense? And then, so when I have my obedience tested then in this life, then I can look to Abraham as an example and say, yes, and I can do the same thing. And I can expect the Lord to bless me because of my obedience, just the way he did Abraham. Uh, what new things have we learned about the book of Abraham as scholars, as scholars have looked at it closely? So what have we learned through, what are some of the new things we've learned through scholarship on the book of Abraham? Well, uh, a lot of them have to deal with historical authenticity. So, so looking at some of the names, uh, there's a a place that's mentioned in Abraham 110, uh, Olishem. And this is actually uh, John Lundquist back in, I think it was the 1970s, noticed that this is an actual place name. And it was attested in one inscription by Rim Sin. Uh, just this year, a new inscription of Rim Sin's mentioning Olishem also showed up, and there's been, uh, if you look at this place in the, in the scholarly literature among the cuneiform specialists, there's a lot written on it. Um, and, but this is an actual place name, and we, they debate about exactly where you're going to find it, and archaeologists debate, and so some, one of them said, yeah, I think I've discovered it. And another one says, no, I don't think you did. And these are both archaeologists on the same dick. <laughs> they're they're uh, teammates, but they don't agree on that interpretation. They, they, they literally don't even agree on where they're digging, on, on the name of it. The name of, well, that's because they haven't found the name. They know the, they know the site they're digging. And one of them says, I think it's this place. And the other one says, no, I think it's this place that's mentioned in the literature. And, um, and, but if they do find the place, and you've got, actually got an archaeological site, what does this tell you about, um, about the Book of Abraham? So while... I was cautiously optimistic when this first came out. And although I don't think that they've, I, I think it's unlikely that, it, that, that that's the correct location. The mere fact that you've got a location and learning about that particular location let me see certain things about the text of the Book of Abraham that I hadn't seen before. Um, because this site is located on a plain. So in the Book of Abraham it talks about this being on the plains of Olishem. And it's the largest mound on that plain. Now, the, maybe the plain is not the right plain. But thinking about it as, if we're looking for it, we should be probably looking for a plain that has a very large mound in it that serves as the, the largest city in the area and dominating the other cities, and that those plains are named after it because it is the largest location there. And 
I wouldn't have been thinking along those lines if I hadn't had to confront the archaeological arguments that were made. And even if I am less inclined to think that they're accurate right now, that that's the right place, it's still going to be something like it. And, and so even in this case, uh, what may be a false clue is still useful in, in understanding the text and seeing it as a real place. Why is the Book of Abraham important to us or why should we care about it? That's a, okay, so that's a really good question. So why, why should we care if we have a Book of Abraham? There have been a number of people who propose that the church should just drop it. So I got thinking about that a number of years ago. What do you lose if you take out the Book of Abraham? And it turns out it plays a very key role in Latter-day Saint thought. Because if you look at the, what we cite the Book of Abraham most for, it's our knowledge of the preexistence. There are other scriptures that talk about the preexistence in the Latter-day Saint scriptural canon. But most of them are vague. So they'll mention preexistence mainly of Jesus Christ. So we know that Christ lived before this life. There's only one other scripture, or in one case we have a, a prophet being known before he was born. But there's only one other scripture in the entire Latter-day Saint canon that puts us there. And it's not as explicit as the Book of Abraham. There's a reason we cite it. Uh, the only time the Book of Abraham is cited in the current church missionary discussions is this bit about the preexistence and being able to put us there. It's not only did Jesus Christ exist before this mortal ex existence, but so did we. We had a role there. We had, and if you look at, at the way we talk about preexistence in the church, all of these discussions we have about premortal life and the way we think about it in the church are all go back to the book of Abraham. If we lose the book of Abraham, we lose that. And that's a huge part of the way that Latter-day Saints think. And one of the bigger differences between the way Latter-day Saints think about things and the way that other religious denominations think about this life. Yeah. So, and it gives us an explicit purpose of why we're here on earth. And it's clear and succinct and, um, and, and can be very powerful. And all of that comes from the Book of Abraham. And if we take that out, uh, then we lose a great deal in the church. Yeah, in fact, I think, uh, you know, these days there's a lot of talk of identity, right? And I think it's fair to say the belief that we were with God before this life is a big part of Latter-day Saint identity, right? It is. It is. So you um, remember one Egyptologist um, talking to somebody and saying and why he wouldn't um, why he wouldn't attack the Book of Abraham like this individual wanted him to and he said you it's not my job to rob people of meaning in their lives. You know, I was paraphrasing, but um, that's taking away the Book of Abraham does that. Is if you take that away, then it robs Latter-day Saints of meaning in their lives. What do we lose if we give up on the Book of Abraham? What's at stake? There are a number of things that if if you give up on the Book of Abraham, that, that you lose. One of them is 
although it's not as central as the Book of Mormon. Uh, you, in what I've seen with people who give up on the Book of Abraham, is that they tend to give up on the notion of Joseph Smith being a prophet, seer, and revelator, and someone who brought forth ancient scriptures. Um, and it's, it hollows them out. And so you can lose a great deal by uh, capitulating on the issue. And, and when they capitulate on this issue, then a number of other issues tend to, they tend to capitulate on as well on um, that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. Uh, they give up on that. They tend to end up capitulating on, on whether there, there's one true church, on whether there's divine authority in the church. Um, and so it on the one hand, it seems like such a small thing, and it seems like it shouldn't make a difference. But in practice, it does. It's a little bit like um, driving without a seatbelt. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you were part of the committee or the group, the team that uh, was involved in uh, creating some of the resources uh, for Pearl of Great Price Central. Uh, what made that particular group of people or that team uniquely qualified to, uh, to approach the Book of Abraham? And uh, why was it important to collaborate and work together? Well, let me tell you a little bit about the team working behind Pearl of Great Price Central. So we had um, three Latter-day Saint are three individuals with PhDs in Egyptology from three different locations. So we'd all been trained by different, um, I don't know if you can quite call it schools of thought, but at least in different programs. So uh, it gave us a, a wider perspective in the, the training. We also had at least two individuals who uh, were involved in church history uh, one of them had been. One of them has been con uh, doing contributions on church history for a number of years. Another one had been a researcher in the Joseph Smith Papers Project. Uh, so we covered those bases. Uh, we also had a couple of other people who, without specific scholarly training in either of those areas. Oh, and we, we had a um, we had another person who has a master's in in Egyptology from yet another location. So uh, we got a variety of, of backgrounds. The and I you can't really underestimate the role that the people without training or without specific training played in it as well because. It's very easy when you're immersed in a scholarly field to talk in jargon that no one outside the field will understand or at least not understand properly. And while we thought that uh, we were explaining things to a, a non-specialist audience, and some of us have some experience in that, we occasionally slip in stuff that's uh, that's insider talk, and these people could spot that and say, "You need to explain this, or you need to make it a, so that so that you shouldn't have to have graduate training in Egyptology to follow the discussion." And so that's one of the things that uh, one of the strengths the committee had. Another of the ground rules we set on the committee 
was that we wanted, uh, if you look at the things written by committee, committees um, tend to produce something that nobody likes. Um, the Nicene Creed was church doctrine by committee. And we come, you come out of that and Eusebius says, well, tells his, his congregation, uh, this is the best the committee could do. They worked really hard. Uh, we know you don't understand it, but, you know, but we worked really hard, so you ought to just take what the committee says. We took a little different take with the committee uh, uh, behind the Pearl of Great Price Central, at least it, as far as the Book of Abraham materials went. And that is we told the committee, look, we don't want uh, we don't want anything to put anything in here that you're uncomfortable with. And, you know, we, we come from different backgrounds. We're different people, and we have different training, and we didn't always agree. But one of the, the ground rules, we thought, is that you need to be able to say, yes, I it's, yes, I accept what's here. I, I can back it, not, I can hold my nose. Um, you know, and, and there were a number of things where we had things that were delayed um, or taken off the table simply because we couldn't get agreement on the committee and we wanted everybody to be able to be comfortable saying, this is something that I can support. And so, and sometimes it, it was got down into the words or turns of phrases, sometimes it was the general concept, but we felt that, and I, I hope that the other committee members feel this way, that we could support whatever was going up there. And, uh, or that we, and there is some safety in that as well, is because you shouldn't be getting in Pearl Great Price Central any of our idiosyncratic ways of looking at the text. Um, you know, some of us have very particular ideas about the text, and we may be right, and we may be completely wrong. But by making sure that it wasn't idiosyncratic, then we hopefully avoid being glaringly wrong. Um, there, A. E. Hausman talked about Scaliger as a Scaliger was a brilliant classicist, and he and had very some brilliant ways of looking at the text, but also some very peculiar ones, and Hausman said about him is that there were things that only Scaliger could have gotten wrong here. And hopefully we've avoided that, that tendency. Uh, and we, so we tried to use the best of the committee approach without, um, without getting an approach that ends up being unreadable or um, so much of a compromise that nobody really likes it.